So far, you have learned that companies produce goods and services based on the available supply of raw materials, labor, capital, and so forth, as well as on the demand of the consumer. Remember that the producer can manufacture a product or provide a service that meets already existing demand, or they can produce a good or service and create their own market. The point where the supply and demand meet is the equilibrium point. How does the profit motive play a role in everything you've learned so far about supply and demand? Recall that any time the supplier produces above equilibrium point, they will end up with a surplus and may have to eat the production costs of any overages. On the flip side, any time that the supplier produces less than equilibrium, then a shortage, a shortage is created and the supplier is missing out on potential profits up to the equilibrium point. All of that being said, the supplier is producing goods and services to make a profit. This profit could be reinvested back into the company in order to grow it. It can be spent by the owner or divvied up amongst the shareholders in dividend payments. It can be invested in the market in order to produce a return. It can also be divided amongst the labor force in the form of raises or cost of living increases and or in the, in the form of benefits, more comprehensive health insurance packages, matching 401ks, maternal or paternal leave. The point is that the producer produces in order to better his or her life to grow his or her company. It's not done to make the lives of the consumers better, but this is normally a side effect of the transaction between the producer and consumer. Scottish economist Adam Smith recognized this fact in 1776 in the book, The Wealth of Nations. Smith recognized that the division of labor has played an important role in the development of what we know as civilization. Think back in time to when families lived alone and quite a distance apart from others. In these situations, it was necessary for the family to be completely self-sufficient. Construction, cooking, weaving, farming, any task that had to be done for the family's survival had to be accomplished within that family. Or take the building of a single car. One person tasked with the construction of a car would find that finishing said car might take weeks. Enter the division of labor. Each person in society or in a company has a special set of skills or a small number of tasks to complete. By dividing labor, more tasks are finished in a shorter period of time. Whereas the one car builder might take weeks to finish the car, on an assembly line, hundreds of cars can be built in a single day. Adam Smith on the benefits. It is the great multiplication of the productions of all the different arts in consequence of the division of the labor, which occasions in a well-governed society that universal opulence which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people. Translation. Because all sorts of jobs have been divided, and because so much more is able to be produced in the same period of time, and because this has been accomplished in a well-governed, free society, all of the goods and services that came as a result of the division of labor are available then to every individual within that society. Take a second to think about this question. Would you rather be a billionaire in the year 1900, or a person with average wealth in the current year? Why? In the year 1900, humans were still three years away from flight. The phonograph had existed for 13 years, but the first radio station was still 20 years away. The first television broadcast was 36 years away. Traveling from New York to San Francisco took three and a half days by train. Smallpox and polio were still major concerns. Today, we have more information at our fingertips than what is contained in the Library of Congress. Your calculator has more computing power than the computers NASA used during the Apollo program. You can watch movies in your car. You have a car. Smallpox and polio were eradicated in the United States in the 1950s. We have very little concern that our food will be tainted by the time it reaches our plate. We live in the most advanced societies the world has ever seen, and much of that is due to the division of labor, guaranteed rights, and capitalism. So how has this been possible? It is the maxim of every prudent master of a family never to attempt to make it home, which it will cost him more to make than buy. What is prudence in the conduct of every private family can scarce be folly in that of a great kingdom. Again, your translation. Why would you pay more to make something than it would cost to just go out and buy it? This made sense to Smith, and it makes sense to us because anytime the producer increases his or her or their efficiency uh, in creating a product and decreases the cost associated with making a single unit, then over time, it will be cheaper to buy a product at market 
than it will be to make the product yourself. Smith goes on to say that all the interactions between producers and consumers, the prices and the quantities produced are all coordinated by some unseen force. This he calls the invisible hand. They are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life, which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants. And thus without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interest of the society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. So in producing goods or services to satisfy the desire for profit and the human drive to create a better life for self and family, the producer also creates a benefit for the consumer. Rather than spending hours making butter or raising a barn or doing whatever tasks must be done at home, the consumer can go to the market to buy the butter he or she needs, or he or she can hire someone else to build the barn and in so doing, they'll be able to devote their time to their own business interests, their family, or recreational pursuits. This fact in turn creates more markets, creates more growth, and creates more opportunities for advancement due to specialization. In this clip from A Beautiful Mind, physicist and future Princeton professor John Nash is struggling to find what he believes would be a breakthrough idea for his doctoral thesis. The idea behind Nash's non-cooperative games or game theory is that rather than producers creating a good or service that provides them with a profit and an incidental benefit for the consumer, Nash believed that equilibrium, now known as the Nash equilibrium, would be achieved when the actions or decision-making processes of every player in the game were taken into consideration rather than just the decision-making process of a single player. We have, most, we have mostly looked into the motivations that go into the supplier's process but just as important is the motivation that goes into the demanders process. Let's take a look at one of the best known applications of game theory. It's called the dilemma of the prisoners. Let's take a look at one of the best known applications of game theory. It's called the dilemma of the prisoners. In this scenario, you and a friend, you and a colleague, you and a complete stranger have just been arrested by the police. They're gonna take you to separate holding cells and then they're gonna ask you whether you wanna confess or not confess. Now, depending on what you and the other person say, and remember, you don't know what they're gonna do, any combination of your choices is going to lead to an outcome. So if both of you confess, you're gonna get early parole. If one of you confesses and the other doesn't confess, the person who confesses is gonna get hard time, the person who didn't confess is gonna be set free. If you both don't confess, you're gonna get short sentences. But the problem with these choices is that your best possible solution is not to confess because then you could be set free. If you do confess, you could be given hard time. But if you both confess, the second best thing that could happen to you is that you can both get early parole. So it really comes down to what do you think you should do in light of whomever it was that was arrested with you? Okay, so now we're going to try this out. Find somebody around you, could be a roommate, could be a parent, brother or sister, whoever's there. And what I want you to do is take out two separate sheets of paper. Could just be small bits of paper that you rip off or whatever. And without indicating to the other person what you're gonna choose, write down that you're either gonna confess or that you're not going to confess and have the other person do the same thing. Once you both have written down whatever it is your choice is, then reveal them to each other to see what would have happened. All right, now let's take this up a notch. We've seen what would happen if prison time was, was at stake. But what if we really up the ante and make the punishments much, much more severe and much, much more lenient? Okay, so in this scenario here, if you confess, if both of you confess, you're going to get 10 years in prison. If one of you confesses, 
and the other doesn't confess, the person who doesn't confess is going to be set free. The person who confesses is actually going to be given the death penalty. If both of you choose not to confess, then you're both going to get life in prison. So in this case, your best possible scenario is not confessing, but by not confessing, you could also spend life in prison. Your second best scenario is to confess and you'll get 10 years in prison. But if you confess and the other person doesn't, then you're going to receive the death penalty. So what this does is it just introduces a little slightly different bit of dynamic here and we'll see what your choices are. Go ahead and repeat the exercise again and see what the outcome is. Nash's theory has most famously been used to determine what action should be taken by the U.S. government during the Cold War in the arms race with the Soviet Union, which we will read about, but it also has applications in the so-called Battle of the Sexes, analyses of bank runs and currency crises, and even penalty kicks in soccer.